So we are very happy to have Juliana Timosko, who will tell us about comparing different bases for irreducible symmetric group representations. All right, thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be digitally here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a collection of work, um, some of which is joint with uh, Heather Russell and some with Talia Goldwasser and Garcia Sun. Um, uh, and then some at the end uh, is also a little bit speculative and will just be enthusiastic and involve waving my hands vigorously. Um, so, uh, there we go. All right. Technology has not failed me this early in the talk. Um, so here's sort of the general outline, um, and uh, and it sort of this outline is in a little bit of a funny order because we're sort of going to start and to end with some words on changing bases um, for group representations, uh, both the why and then sort of returning at the end uh, with some specific results. And in between those two, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about two specific bases, um, the tableau bases from combinatorics and geometry, and especially talking a little bit about Springer fibers uh, in that context, and also the web basis from knot theory um, and some quantum representations. Uh, so uh, I realize I'm talking with uh, representation theorists here. Um, so, uh, so, so on some level, representations and bases of representations, um, you've thought about a lot, uh, but I'm still going to dedicate some words, uh, partly, uh, partly because uh, you know there's a ton of different kinds of representation theory, um, and uh, and I'm situated here in a context of combinatorial representation theory. So sort of here are the fundamental questions that I care about. Um, so first, our setup. Uh, I've got a complex vector space. Uh, I am thinking about finite complex representations. I'm generally thinking about SN, although you could ask me at some point uh, if you wanted to think about other Lie types. Um, and uh, there are a lot of questions that are easy to answer using bases, right? You can ask about dimensions. Uh, you can ask about specific maps or matrices. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the question of uh, what's in the span of what else is easy to answer using a basis. And of course, the answers may or may not be independent of the choice of basis. Right, so something like dimension is something. Some some questions are completely dependent. If you're thinking about, like, for instance, the matrix of a linear transformation, and some it may be very easy to answer whether something is in the span of a particular set of vectors with one choice of uh, basis for that span, and quite hard with another choice. Um, uh, so, um, so that's sort of the first launching off point, right? You could either decide to throw out bases as this sort of basically, that was a pun, art, uh, sort of arbitrary choices or, you know, artifacts um, of, of sort of just human, human uh, objects. Uh, but at the same time, some bases are extremely natural and lead to deep mathematics. So, uh, so, uh, so my point of view is that I like bases, um, and I actually find uh, thinking about bases and the kinds of questions that you can specifically answer with bases often useful um, uh, and or beautiful. So, uh, all right. So here, for instance, is a classical example. Um, we can think about symmetric polynomials. So these are polynomials in n variables uh, that are invariant under permutation. So if you imagine permuting the indices of your variables, uh, sometimes your uh, sometimes your polynomial uh, remains unchanged. You know, any any permutation you do in one part of the polynomial is made up for compensated in another part of the polynomial, and sometimes it isn't. Um, so the symmetric polynomials are just going to be those polynomials that, uh, as a whole polynomial, stays the same. Uh, so for instance, here are some examples of symmetric polynomials when we have three variables. Uh, x1 squared is not symmetric by itself, but the whole sum of uh, squares of everything is symmetric, as is a product of all the variables, as is if you have these sort of uh, different powers uh, with different variables, as long as you sort of, you could think of it as take x1 squared x2, 
hit it with every possible uh, permutation, add them all up, and there you just created something that's symmetric. Um, and symmetric polynomials have many, many bases. This is like a foundational piece of algebraic combinatorics. You can take power sum bases. So this is essentially uh, sort of a version of that first polynomial we looked at. If you just take all possible sums of all possible, uh, so if you take the sum of all variables raised to each of the possible exponents, I hope I got my for alls unambiguous there. But anyways, if you look at those examples, um, add them all up, and then you can use any different exponent. Um, there's the monomial basis. Uh, so here you think about taking any possible monomial in your variables, and then uh, uh, and then doing what I said of hitting it with all possible permutations and adding them together. So that includes the power sum basis, but then you have all sorts of other things where you have mixed terms with a monomial that has a product of multiple things. Um, you could take the elementary basis. So this is like taking a monomial basis, but all the powers, uh, uh, all any anytime you see an exponent of two or greater, you throw out uh, and don't consider those. Um, and then there's Schur polynomials, which are harder to describe in you know 25 words or less. So I'll just say they're the characters of the irreducible representations of GLNC. Um, and that's part of the point is that uh, is that here's this one particular basis that arises very naturally from a uh, sort of intrinsic representation theory um, uh, calculation, um, and then. Furthermore, not only are some of these bases quite natural, and others of them are very natural from a combinatorial or algebraic point of view, um, but furthermore, uh, if you think about changing bases between the pairs of these bases, uh, the transition matrix, um, which is synonymous with, and I will use synonymously with, change of basis matrix, um, the transition matrix between any two of these bases is upper triangular. Uh, that's sort of unusual in the world of all matrices. Uh, it has ones along the diagonal. So ones along the diagonal and upper triangular is unitriangular. And furthermore, the entries of these matrices are important combinatorial quantities. Um, and what that quantity is sort of depends on the pair of matrices, uh, the pair of bases that you're comparing and which order you're switching the bases. Um, but as an example, uh, you can get the Koska numbers as entries uh, of these um, transition matrices. So I mentioned Springer fibers earlier in the talk. Uh, Koska numbers uh, actually record Betty numbers of Springer fibers. Uh, so again, the sort of combinatorial quantity showing up in a change of basis matrix that is uh, that is a little bit miraculously uh, recording an intrinsic topological structural quantity of of a certain geometric object. Uh, so, all right. So that was the quick introduction and motivation for why even if in general you might be a person who dedicates uh, your life to not thinking about specific bases but thinking about a sort of more abstract uh, vector space uh, consideration, um, at least it is interesting to have people out there who analyze both bases and change of bases uh, matrices because they are giving these sorts of, um, when, when you have the right sort of bases and when you are looking at uh, the changes between the right sort of bases, you're often uh, uncovering important quantities um, that are intrinsic to some or another feature of the problem. So having said that, I'd like to review uh, uh, what we're going to call the uh, tableau basis. Um, so an important basis uh, for uh, symmetric group representations. I'm going to start with a partition of n. Uh, so uh, just writing n as a sum of uh, sum of non-zero uh, parts. Um, and I'm always going to be describing my partition as a Young diagram. So the Young diagram associated to a particular partition is an arrangement of boxes. For me, they are left aligned and top aligned, as in those examples on the bottom of your screen. The upstairs corner is sort of a thing that actually has one specific corner, and everything's been shoved up to the up and to the left. Um, if you have a partition, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so on, uh, it corresponds to the diagram with lambda i boxes in the i-th row. 
Um, so these, these particular diagrams correspond to the partition 221. Uh, and a young tableau is a young diagram that has been filled with numbers according to some rule. Um, it, there are a bunch of different rules depending on what sort of thing you are interested in. Uh, for us, it will be always the numbers one through n without repetition. Um, we are going to have two basic rules that are floating around. Um, one of them is row strict. Uh, so numbers are increasing in each row from left to right. Uh, another is standard. So that means both row strict and column strict in the sense that numbers also increase in each column top to bottom. Uh, so in the two examples at the bottom of the screen, um, both of these examples are row strict. Uh, each row has the smaller number on the left insofar as there is a smaller number. Um, only one of them is standard. The one on the left, if you read the columns top to bottom, you've got one, two, five, and then three, four, which are both increasing. Whereas the one on the right, I exchanged two of the rows. Um, so no longer column strict. All right. Uh, we'd sort of like to just let the permutation group act on Young Tableau directly by permuting entries, uh, but uh, this whole numbers increase left to right in each row is just not preserved by most permutations, um, so you need to mess around with that a little bit. Um, and basically, the trick to uh, the the core piece of the trick to getting a good SN representation on Young Tableau is to say instead of thinking about Young Tableau, I'm going to sort of take these equivalence classes um, where I sort of just let myself mess up the rows and just consider the whole rows as a block or as a as a set instead of uh, as uh, an ordered uh, tuple. Um, and so using that trick and a little bit more conventions, you actually uh, get a well-defined SN action. Um, uh, and uh, so this is often this sort of description of uh, this description of a permutation action, which I have not given you in any detail. Um, but if you follow through the formal technicalities, you get young standard representation. And the algebraic objects uh, sort of spanned by the Young tableau uh, with appropriate modifications are called spec modules. Uh, so the key points that, that, that we will need is that each shape lambda corresponds to an irreducible representation, and a one of the um, the one classic basis for the spec module uh, it, it consists of vectors, each one of which is indexed by its own standard Young tableau t on the shape lambda. So uh, so the takeaway here is we can't quite let the symmetric group act on Young Tableau, but we can add a couple more uh, levels of abstraction and get a basis uh, in which the Young Tableau sort of naturally are, are indexing a basis that gives us an irreducible representation of type lambda. Now, I'd like to also think a little bit about uh, a partial order on the tableau. So, so I started that statement by saying that permutations don't actually act on standard Young tableau, and they don't. But if two numbers are not in the same row or in the same column, then you can switch them and get another standard Young tableau. So the problem of letting permutations act on Tableau is just solely when that makes things no longer be in order. Um, so, I, so using this rule, we get something that gives us a partial order on standard Young Tableau. I'm only going to look at simple transpositions i, i plus 1. Um, and I get pictures like this. Uh, so starting at the top, uh, if I start with this uh, Young diagram, uh, six boxes in a little rectangle, I'm filling them uh, top to bottom in each column. Uh, so I can, if I go down the left, I'm thinking about exchanging two and three. Uh, I still have a standard Young Tableau when I do that. If I go out the right, I can exchange four and five and get some other standard Young Tableau. Uh, I can 
do that in the opposite order. And either way, I will end up with this uh, fourth young tableau. And then finally, I can exchange three and four um, and end up down at the bottom there. Uh, so it's sort of not, uh, it's not, it's not a full SN action, um, but it is giving us some sort of information and giving us an interesting uh, partial order on young tableau, um, to which we will return in uh, not a huge amount of time. Uh, but I'd like to take one other digression through Springer fibers, um, which I referred to a little bit before. Um, so when I'm thinking about Springer fibers, uh, Springer fibers are sub-varieties of the flag variety. Uh, so the flag variety is the quotient GLNC mod B. Uh, I'm going to just think of B as the collection of upper triangular matrices. Uh, so if you prefer to think about things algebraically, uh, the flag variety is just uh, cosets of matrix times upper triangular matrices. Um, we can also describe them as, as a collection of nested subspaces in CN. So each coset corresponds to a line V1 contained in a plane, V2 contained in a three space, V3 contained in uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to um, CN. If you want to go between these two descriptions, uh, given any matrix, you can think about the line V1 that's spanned by the first column of that matrix, the plane V2 that's spanned by the first two columns of that matrix, the three-dimensional space V3 that's spanned by the first three columns, and so on. Um, and if you're interested in a small linear algebra exercise, you can convince yourself uh, that the, uh, the different matrices that give you the same collection of nested subspaces is precisely the coset part. Um, so, so the group B describes the uh, different choices you can take for G to uh, recover one particular collection of nested subspaces. So that's a sort of geometric ambient space that we have. Uh, let's let X be some linear operator or just n by n matrix. Um, so the Springer fiber of X is uh, two different equivalent characterizations. It's the collection of flags so that G inverse XG is upper triangular. Um, or this second definition, the collection of flags so that X sends the ith part of the flag into the ith part of the flag for all I. So this is something a little bit like the set of flag, like the set of eigen flags uh, for X uh, on some level or flags that are fixed by X. Uh, so, um, so on the one hand, this is just some condition, right? It's like, so, so, so actually this is some linear algebraic condition uh, and you could go around, if somebody gives you a matrix X, you could go about figuring out precisely which matrices G satisfy this condition, G inverse X, G is upper triangular. Um, you'd have uh, a collection of linear algebra problems coming out of that. Um, uh, and some of them may feel tedious or onerous or confusing, but also like they're like well within the grasp of say an undergraduate linear algebra class. Like this is a very concrete um, problem. If the question is just sort of here's a matrix, can you describe what flags are in this Springer fiber? Uh, so we actually have a theorem then that says Springer fibers are paved by affine cells uh, CW intersect CX. Uh, that's a, yeah, okay, I can explain that name too. So Springer fibers are paved by affine cells um, and the cells are enumerated uh, by certain tableau. So I'm gonna start by explaining uh, some of the weird symbols in here and then I'm going to add more information to this theorem. So first I wanna say what I mean by the shape lambda of X. Uh, X is a matrix, X, has some Jordan canonical form. Jordan blocks partition N. If it's an N by N matrix, Jordan blocks are going to partition N. So we actually get a partition associated to N matrix. Uh, and so the shape of that matrix um, is that that's the partition and the, young, the shape of the Young diagram that I want to think about. 
Uh, so this second piece, uh, my curly S, that's my Springer fiber of X. Um, and for people who have thought about fly varieties, my CW are actually Schubert cells. So intersections of Schubert cells with Springer fibers. So uh, finally, what do I mean by a paving uh, by affine cells? Um, I, I mean, a, it's a specific kind of partition of my, of my Springer fiber uh, into subspaces that have nice enough closure conditions so that I can do homology and cohomology calculations with them. Uh, so it's not quite as fancy as a CW complex, but it still gives you uh, it still gives you the sort of the first first order goals of algebraic topology, right? So uh, so so um, technical details available upon request. Uh, you, could, you could put it in the chat, for instance. Um, so, okay, Springer fibers are paved by affine cells. Um, the non-empty cells are enumerated by row-strict tableau. So just having rows increase left to right uh, is going to give you non-empty cells. And furthermore, uh, furthermore, even though this is sort of described as a combinatorial bijection, um, the, there, it, it's a actually slightly more direct linear algebra kind of result. Um, the, essentially, the fillings of the uh, Young diagram are telling you when to add each basis vector to the flag. Um, and if you know when to add each basis vector to the flag, then uh, you can use sort of Gaussian elimination to decide what else, uh, what else can go in at that particular moment. We're not quite done with this slide. Uh, the cells that have maximal dimension are enumerated by standard tableau of shape lambda. So uh, you get all possible cells with row strict. And if you want the top dimensional cells, look at the standard tableau of each shape. Uh, so, so part of what this is telling us, since, since most young diagrams have multiple different standard tableau associated to them, part of what this is telling you is that Springer fibers in general have multiple components. You know, so they've got some sort of small stuff here, and then they're going to have lots, lots of pieces glued on and glued on to each other. Um, so I, when we're thinking about the dimension of these cells, uh, there's a sort of more general formula for counting dimension. Um, and just like you can come out, count uh, the dimension of a Schubert cell um, by looking at inversions in a permutation. So if you order the numbers that you've permuted from left to right, the inversions tell you how many of those numbers are out of order pairwise with respect to each other. Um, just so uh, we can actually compute the dimension from the row strict tableau by sort of looking at uh, some of the inversions that you would count in sort of normal permutation or flag world. Um, uh, and then the things that have most possible dimension are just turn out to be standard. So here's a representation theory uh, motivation. So Springer fibers um, come from representation, they, they arise from Tony Springer's work. Um, uh, Springer discovered that uh, SN acts naturally on the cohomology of the Springer fiber, which was named after him, not by him. Um, so the, the top dimensional cohomology of the Springer fiber is irreducible. Um, and in fact, the top dimensional cohomology of the Springer fiber associated to X is irreducible of type lambda x. Uh, this theorem, oh, there we go, great. OK, um, and the, the set, if you look at the top dimensional cohomology ranging over all uh, nilpotent conjugacy classes of x, or equivalently, if you let lambda be all possible partitions of n, then the set of the top dimensional cohomologies that you get are precisely the collection of irreducible representations of SN. Um, so, uh, so Springer, Springer first discovers this uh, collection of results in uh, 1976, and then lots of other people revisit um, this in uh, multiple, with sort of multiple different motivations. Um, 
uh, giving so, so Springer's result is sort of more I don't know, number theoretic committee. Uh, so some people are interested in a more uh, geometric or topological approach. Garcia Perchese um, give uh, give a beautiful sort of combinatorial description. Uh, but there's like there's 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 a lot of things to be said about this. Actually, since we're on the topic of why are bases uh, important. Um, I think it is fair to say that all of these things are called and referred to as the Springer representation, no matter who constructs it. Um, but in point of fact, uh, some of them construct the same representation that Springer did, and some of them construct the dual representation uh, and also call it the Springer representation. Um, so, like, so, you know. Basically, basically, generally, when people construct a Springer representation, they confirm that the top dimensional, uh, that the top dimensional representation is irreducible of the desired type, and then sort of stop there. Uh, so, um, all right. So that's, I think, I think this is about all I want to say about tableau bases. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can, can you yes. go back to slides? <laughs> two slides. Yeah. Yes. So here, um, is there a way to tell from W whether um, a cell is uh, non-empty or of maximal dimension? Is there an easy way, relatively easy way to? Yes. I, so so um, yeah, one of the ways of doing it is like, well, if this sounds easy to you, I don't know which sort of corner of Matthew I in, but like, if you imagine you have the shape, the Young diagram mm -hmm. that lambda x gives you, uh, if you imagine your permutation w is written in one line notation, mm -hmm. um, and then if you just fill the boxes in from bottom left up the top column and then keep going mm -hmm. bottom to top up each column, mm -hmm. uh, if you end up with something that's row strict, then that cell should be non-empty. I see. Okay, so essentially, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so easy in particular examples and very easy if you're a computer. <laughs> right. Thank you. Sure. I, I also have a question. Yes. Uh, I, I may be asking you to spoil your talk, in which case I apologize. But um, is that partially ordered set that you wrote down earlier, the post set of uh, which cells are in the boundaries of which other cells? Oh, yes. You are spoiling my talk. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, to sort of. So, so ask me that question again in about like fifteen minutes. Cool. Uh, so, all right. So, I I have another basis um, uh, that I want to talk about briefly in this talk, um, and uh, this second basis uh, that I'm going to be talking about is the web basis. Uh, so, a web for SLK is a plane graph. Um, and uh, the idea of the graph is it's this morphism in a diagrammatic category that encodes the representation theory of the universal um, uh, quantum available as a for SLK. Um, so by a plane graph, I mean not just that it's uh, planar and that things don't cross, but that we've actually embedded it in one particular way in the plane. Um, so, uh, so the idea is that uh, this is a diagrammatic category encoding certain representations. Um, so, uh, so that basically we have representations, they satisfy certain algebraic relations, and I'm going to be describing them as pictures. Uh, and the algebraic relations tell me certain sorts of uh, relations that the pictures need to satisfy also. Um, so the you get a collection of scheme theoretic relations that webs have to satisfy. And then you can basically forget that they come from algebra on one point of view and just ask, uh, you know, ask questions about uh, how many webs there are, what are some nice bases for these webs, uh, you know, what are what are representations of the equivalence classes under this scheme theory, and so on. Um, so uh, so we sort of think of on the one hand, you get a lot of webs, but uh, they form equivalence classes under the scheme theoretic uh, relations. Um, we consider the vector space uh, generated by these webs uh, as sort of formal vectors. And we generally have specific nice webs uh, that, uh, that are representatives of the equivalence classes. Um, so 
Uh, so for instance, when k equals two, uh, Cooperberg actually has a description, complete description of the combinatorial representation theory of webs uh, for all Lie types, although we're focusing on type A here. Um, and Kavanov actually used them to construct the cohomology of certain Springer fibers. Uh, so this is our beginning of uh, deep connections with knot theory. Um, we're going to look at k equals two right now. Uh, then we'll say a little bit about k equals three, um, and uh, and then and then really beyond that, um, there are deep mysteries. Um, so when k equals two, the webs are non-crossing matchings, uh, which in knot theory land often is called temporally leap diagrams. Uh, so for us, a matching is um, well, I'm going to think of a matching as I have the numbers from one through n, and I want to pair them perfectly, uh, and I'm going to draw arcs between them to indicate where where two numbers are paired. Uh, so if they cross, then that is a not a not crossing matching, and if they don't cross, then it is. Uh, so uh, so if you draw your arcs and they must cross, like in that bottom example, um, don't think about those ones and just think about these other kinds. Uh, if uh, k equals three, uh, <laughs> if k equals three, webs are planar directed graphs. They have boundary, just like the matchings do. You know, that the list of numbers one through n at the bottom, um, and uh, we have the following rules. Uh, so boundary vertices always have degree one. We're going to imagine that these vertices are always sources. So the arrows are pointing out of the boundary. Interior vertices are trivalent, so there's three edges uh, at each meeting, at each interior vertex. Um, and uh, vertices are either sources or sinks. Either all edges come in to a particular vertex or all edges go out of the particular vertex. Uh, the boundary is not uh, considered oriented. So here are two examples, um, and you can both sort of see some pieces of those little arcs that showed up when k equals two, uh, and also see that, uh, you know, k increased by one, and these diagrams got a lot more complicated. Um, uh, so I haven't drawn directions here, because you can also uh, convince yourself, this is a lemma, um, a fun lemma, uh, that if you take the rule that the boundary vertices that all edges in the web from the boundary are directed out, uh, that actually determines the directions on all of the edges in the webs, that together with vertices being either sources or sinks. So k equals three, we have this uh, clear description of what the webs are. They're clearly more complicated than k equals two. Um, we furthermore have a basis for webs in this case. Uh, so reduced webs have no interior faces with fewer than six edges. Uh, so these webs, these webs, because I picked n equals six so that I could draw it easily, um, they don't actually have any interior faces. They've all got the boundary line for part of their, for, for one part of their, uh, for, for one edge on their face. Um, but if you have any faces in the inside and you just go around, you shouldn't see any pentagons um, or any squares. Uh, so, uh, so the fact, the statement is that reduced webs actually form a basis for the vector space of webs. And now the web bases have an SN action. They have an action of the permutation group. Um, basically, uh, you know, if you want to uh, think about what a simple transposition does, it braids, it, you can just sort of twist two strands. Um, uh, and that's the action of uh, the simple transposition that exchanges i and i plus one. We then, web space comes equipped with certain resolutions, um, these scheme theoretic reductions. Uh, so you just can braid a strand and then resolve. Um, and when we do this sort of operation, so for instance, uh, so for instance, when we, if we were to twist that second and third strand uh, and get a crossing 
uh, the uh, we would we would get this uh, nested shape over on the left hand side. If we instead do the same thing, twisting the fourth and fifth strand, we would get a nesting like on the right hand side. Um, you could continue doing these operations, twisting in any allowable way, and move through all possible non-crossing matchings um, up to the completely fully nested thing down at the bottom. So here are some comparisons between web bases and other bases uh, that are already in the literature. Um, so Cooperberg and Kavanov uh, proved that web bases and Tableau bases are bijective. Uh, Frankel and Kavanov proved that web bases and dual canonical bases coincide for k equals two. Uh, so for a while, it was some thought maybe they coincided more generally, um, but in fact they don't coincide uh, when k is greater than two. Actually, you know, in general, k equals two is a very very special case just because it's small and everything, there's not enough room for things to be different. Uh, so here are some results. Now we're at part four of the talk, uh, starting to compare web and Tableau ACs first for k equals two. Um, so there is a natural map between webs and Tableau. Uh, that map is not SN equivariant, um, mostly because if you twist strands and then resolve, um, you uh, that's that's not a completely reversible operation. Whereas if you exchange numbers in a tableau, that is a completely reversible operation. Um, so the natural map between webs and tableau is not SN equivariant, but the transition matrix is upper triangular with ones along the diagonal. Uh, so we conjectured that the entries are non-negative, which Rhodes uh, proved, uh, and then N and G also proved that um, we found certain of the upper triangular entries vanished, uh, so they proved that these are actually the only zero entries in the transition matrix, um, and I just saw some preliminary results uh, that might describe the entries, uh, the non-zero entries, um, as uh, combinatorial, so that interprets the non-zero entries as uh, combinatorially, so counting some other quantity. One key observation for this particular result is that the partial order on webs corresponds to nesting and unnesting of arcs. Uh, so now, back to this question. Um, so if you go to the Springer fibers, specifically those that correspond to the, the two row rectangles, um, these are the Springer fibers that correspond to SL2 webs. Each uh, cell corresponds to uh, some kind of uh, non crossing matching. The top dimensional cells are perfect non crossing matchings, uh, lower dimensional cells have some sort of extra decoration. Um, and uh, Speaking slightly informally, if you want to find the closures of the cells in this paving that we talked about before, um, it's characterized by uh, nesting and unnesting of the arcs. Uh, so again, these cells form a paving by affines, not a CW complex. Uh, so sometimes only part of a cell is in the closure of another cell. Um, and here's an example uh, so here's an example, uh, sort of pictorial example of the closure of one particular cell. So we're looking at the closure of this fully nested two arc cell that's at the very top. Um, and if you sort of write out the flags that represent that uh, two dimensional cell, you sort of have a couple of different entries uh, with that A and B up at the top, these two different parameters. You can imagine going to the boundary um, either by somehow uh, sending A to the limit or sending B to the limit. Um, if you send B to the limit and head off to the right on your screen, you get something that's a fully perfect non-crossing matching, but you're actually only picking up a one-dimensional piece of what actually should be a two-dimensional cell in the full Springer fiber. So the closure of this fully nested cell 
lands partly in a subspace of the other maximal dimensional cell. And it's only picking up the piece where those two variables A are, are like, where two entries are the same. If you go the other direction, uh, well, then you get this sort of only partial matching. Um, and then you can keep letting your variables go to infinity, looking further in the boundary, and you get to smaller and smaller uh, pieces of the cell. And what that big red circle is showing you is that if you sort of go to the limit in one direction down the right and down the bottom, you get to one particular flag that's actually sitting inside of another cell somewhere else. So like at any given point, when you're taking the closures of these cells, you could be picking up sort of smaller pieces of other cells. Uh, so I think on some level, I'm gonna pause here and say, if you haven't worried about homology stuff in a long time, then you can safely ignore this. Um, uh, but if you have worried about homology for a while, like the whole point of a CW complex was so that you didn't have to worry about things like this, because when things like this happen, sometimes you can get sort of weird closure situations and weird uh, like loops that can show up in your space. So it's kind of amazing both that we can identify, we actually can identify which pieces in the closure actually show up um, and that for all of this, I mean, this is still a paving and everything works out right from a homology point of view. Um, so, all right. Uh, so I think that was Benjamin's question from earlier. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the second piece uh, that I want to go and think about a little bit is, you know, we had webs for k equals three, um, but what does nesting and unnesting mean for SL3 webs, right? So here is another sort of picture of some SL3 webs, uh, and uh, they've just got slightly more complicated shape there. Um, and it's not quite as easy to figure out, like maybe some parts of it, we obviously can see what nests and unnests, but you've also got these adjacent regions that are neither nested nor non-nested. Um, so Kavanov and Kuperberg, uh, thought about introduced depth of regions. So you have this unbounded piece at the very top of the page. Uh, and you can sort of measure how far away you are um, from that unbounded region. Um, so if we do that, for instance, uh, there's two regions above, uh, right under that first curve that are both depth one, two other regions um, that are both depth two. Um, and that actually, that actually introduces an idea of nesting or unnested, uh, unnesting. And as far as these depth bands go, the middle lines aren't really necessary. Um, and uh, so we can somehow have this information about the arcs, um, keep this information about the depth, uh, and then partition our regions into these sort of same depth bands. Uh, this gives us something that actually is a non-crossing matching. It's got isolated dots. Um, nesting and unnesting bands gives now a slightly different partial order than the other partial orders that we had on, on SL3 webs. Um, but it gives us a, I mean, a partial order that we can say a fair amount about because we know how to nest and unnest arcs from, uh, from, the, um, from our previous work. Uh, so we call this the shadow containment partial order because, because arcs are sitting in the shadow of other arcs. And the main theorem that we have is that the transition matrix between the tableau basis and the web basis with respect to this shadow containment partial order is also upper triangular with ones along the diagonal. So, uh, so again, this sort of is indicating that this shadow containment partial order is still carrying uh, relevant, uh, relevant, important information about uh, about the web basis as well. Um, but furthermore, you know, like this shadow containment partial order is uh, sort of not the uh, not the it's not the partial order that we wanted to start with. Um, however, it turns out it's a refinement of the tableau partial order. Um, so in fact, 
uh, the transition matrix between the tabular basis and the red basis with respect to the usual partial orders is also upper triangular with ones along the diagonal. Um, so even more, the takeaway is that, uh, so the takeaway is that even though these webs have lots of decorations, um, some important pieces of the change of basis information is just captured by depth. So that's there. Uh, so I'm going to say a few things about uh, open questions. Um, so one open question, uh, you know, basically, so what about um, <laughs> what about k greater than or equal to four? I usually like giving talks where I just say k or n, and I don't have to instead use very small n. Um, so uh, what about k greater than or equal to four? Um, and the short answer there is um, there's really a lot of deep unknown things about k greater than or equal to four. Um, so we have a pretty good sense of sort of what webs should look like, what sort of equivalence relations should be there. Um, and at the same time, uh, we don't have a great sense of uh, what basis webs should be like. Um, and we don't have a great way of determining. So one thing about a good basis is that uh, somebody should be able to give you an arbitrary element of your vector space. And it should be fairly easy for you to write that arbitrary element in terms of the basis elements, right? Um, and uh, that in particular is uh, hard to do once k greater than or equal to four, where by hard, I mean unknown. Um, so, uh, so, so reduced webs for k greater than or equal to four, uh, there's a lot of things to be explored there. That's one question. Uh, Here's a second question. Uh, how are webs for k equals three uh, related to uh, cells and cell closures for Springer fibers with a three row rectangle? Um, and here, uh, actually, as of, as of two weeks ago, uh, we have some sense that we actually might have a guess about something like this. There's, there's some unfolding and very exciting uh, things to say here. Uh, so, uh, so, so um, if I'm going to, so we have some partial results. We're very excited about them. Um, and, uh, and the, probably the short pieces uh, to say about this is that webs for k equals three um, are uh, made up in various ways of uh, pairs of non-crossing matchings. Uh, and it turns out there's a third sort of set of arcs uh, in, in, in the um, webs so that there's sort of information about a third set of arcs uh, that is carried in this information. Um, and we're pretty sure that we are possibly even by the end of the semester going to be able to describe uh, the cells fairly completely. Um, possibly even the cell closures. Uh, so this general, the general question about what are cell closures for Springer fibers is again, a really subtle and tricky uh, question about which some small pieces are known. So we even, we know for instance, there are some, uh, some of the components of Springer fibers we know to be smooth, for instance. Um, and every now and then we have, like, so sometimes we can, so there's characterizations like that, especially through work of Lucas Fress and Anna Melnikoff. Um, but it's uh, quite hard to characterize um, the particular, the geometry and topology of Springer fibers uh, on the sort of granular level that's um, pretty standard at this point for Schubert calculus. Um, so, I, so I'll, I'll like retain that as a question of uh, characterizing um, closures of Springer fibers. Oh, I think I might also say, uh, just for a second, um, so, I think the other thing that, that, that I might say is, is this, right? Like, um, uh, 
when we first started talking about Springer fibers, we talked about row strict tableau um, as an index set for the cells. And then I also said, okay, we could use non-crossing matchings with some decorations as an index set from the tableaus. And on the one hand, those two are bijective sets of combinatorial sets, right? So like they're completely the same on the one hand. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the information that we know about cell closures is very natural and easy to state in terms of um, in terms of non-crossing matchings and is quite mysterious in terms of tableau. So, uh, so I think the other piece that I sort of put in here as some part of question or underlying philosophy is that it seems like um, webs may be better adapted to describe uh, the geometry of Springer fibers. So webs may be actually encapsulating the geometry and topology of Springer fibers in a way that other combinatorial uh, parameters are, are, are not. Um, and just so the analogy with Schubert cells, we know a lot about closures of Schubert cells um, and certain combinatorial descriptions of permutations uh, give you more information about the closures and what happens in the closures and other combinatorial descriptions do not. So, so somehow finding finding uh, so so the different combinatorial descriptions just simply give you access uh, to to different aspects of the underlying geometry. Um, finally, uh, we've been talking about entries of these transition matrices, um, and uh, just as with uh, so uh, just as as, as we were saying with symmetric uh, polynomials at the beginning of the talk, um, this leads to the very natural next question of like, what are these entries? Um, and specifically, what, uh, what are they counting? Um, so I think that is the question uh, that I'm going to end with. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Great. Let's thank Juliana for the wonderful talk.